The international voice of world evangelism, bringing to you the revelation of Jesus Christ. Welcome to this production by Jesus Christ, Eternal Kingdom of Abundant Life. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The international voice of world evangelism. The only complete God sent message sounding forth in the world today, which is essential for your salvation and translation into the marvelous kingdom of our God. The scriptures tell us to have faith in God, to let him that hath an ear hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And now, let us draw nigh with a pure heart in full assurance of faith, as our beloved brother, internationally known evangelist, teacher, and writer, Reverend George L. Pike, opens to our hearts the mystery of God. Good to be here. Feel the presence of the Lord. Know that He's with us. Had a little trouble coming in this morning. I was telling Betty that I had a little problem with my leg last night, and uh, made made a little difficult. They're real sore. But anyway, uh, this morning. Uh, they remind me with the uh, little palm branches that it's Palm Sunday. <laughs> and uh, I was just talking to Betty about Palm Sunday uh, and how not too long ago we was over in Israel and we came up the little road from Lazarus' tomb And if you remember, Jesus always resorted to Lazarus' home or Mary and Martha's home. And it's right down that road close to the tomb. And uh, Betty and I, we came up that little road with somebody in their car. And when we got right near the gates of Jerusalem, got right near the hilltop heading for the eastern gates, the man that was driving got out of the car, went over the fence, and broke some palm branches and brought them back and put them in the car with me and gave them to me and Betty. And I couldn't figure out what in the world he was doing because he kind of caught me off guard. And I thought, well, what in the world's happened to this fella? And then it, the Lord spoke to me and said, it's Jesus 
in the triumph entry when he went into Jerusalem through the eastern gates according to the prophets and the prophecy of the prophets. The timing was so perfect that if you check the calendar, it was almost right to the date as to the prophecy. And uh, he said, this is what this has to do with. And then it dawned on me, you know, what he was doing. So this morning, uh, I started to dress as usual. And when I reached for clothing, then it came to me that I was to wear this suit this morning. And I, a lot of times the Lord does that. And I, I just don't question. I just try to get whatever I feel He wants me to have. And I put it on, and I remember that this one, like the other one that we wore a few days ago, also came from the West and came from Apple Valley. And it, I would felt He wanted me to wear the hat that the brethren had got for me. And I thought, no, I won't wear it this morning. It was kind of like the other morning. And then I, I saw as it all fit together that He meant for me to wear it. So I, I put it on and came with it. And then I reached for a shirt, and then... Uh, I thought, well, I just don't know what kind of shirt to wear with this suit. It's just a little leisure suit. And then something said, wear this one right here with the double eagle on it. And of course, this one is the one that has the double eagle on it. So he does everything his way. And I had no idea that they were going to open this gate back here and put the little palm branches in the way. That's what the children did at Jesus' triumph entry. And uh, it was strange because I believe that he was playing Long Live the King. I was this morning, I was singing to the Lord, Long Live the King. And uh, then I come in and y'all are playing and singing that. So this morning has a great significance. Not because I'm here, I'm less than nothing, but because you're here and he's here. And that's what makes it great. So then this morning, I apologize for uh, being so ignorant, but I am unless he says something to me. And of course, like I said, my legs were just so sore this morning until it's uh, difficult. It's been difficult for a number of days now, just coming up these steps right here. And then this caught me kind of off guard back here. They don't have any rail work back there except right at the very entrance. So you just pray for me, and uh, I'm praying for you that everything will work out all right. Let's sing a little chorus together, can we, Brother Taylor? Fill my cup, Lord, or I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench the thirsting in my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Feel Until storm glass has on over, till the thunder rolls no more, till the lightning has gone forever from the sky. Guide my feet, Lord, let me stand. In the hollow of your hand Keep me safe Till the storm goes by Can you sing it with me again? Until the storm cloud Pass on over Until the thunder rolls no more until the lightning has gone forever 
from the sky Guide my feet, Lord, hold my hand Keep me, Savior, let me stand Keep me safe till the storm goes on by Let's sing this little chorus, Brother Taylor And he was wounded for my transgression and he was bruised for my iniquity surely he has borne all my sorrows for Once again, Jesus was wounded for your transgression, and he was bruised for your iniquity. Surely he has borne all. Sorrows forever and by his stripes we are healed. Let us enter these gates with thanksgiving in the heart. Enter into his courts with praise and let us say this. Is the day that the Lord hath made. Gonna rejoice cause Jesus made me glad. Oh, Jesus made me glad. Oh, Jesus made me glad. I'm gonna rejoice cause Jesus made me glad. Jesus made me glad. Oh, Jesus made me glad. Gonna rejoice cause Jesus made me glad. So we'll enter into his gate with thanksgiving in the heart. And we'll enter into his courts with his praise. And we'll say this is the day that the Lord hath made. Gonna rejoice cause Jesus made me glad. Sing it with me. Oh, Jesus made me glad, Jesus made me glad, gonna rejoice cause Jesus made me glad, oh, Jesus made me glad, Jesus made me glad, gonna rejoice cause one more time together. heart and enter into the courts with his praise. Sing this is the day that the Lord hath made. Gonna rejoice cause Jesus made me glad. For my Lord made me glad. For Jesus made me glad. And I'm gonna rejoice. Jesus made me glad. Lord made me glad, oh Jesus made me glad, I'm gonna rejoice, Jesus, can you give me my hand? Gonna rejoice because Jesus made me glad. Oh, there's peace. In the times of my trouble, sing that with me. And there's peace in the time of the storm. And there's peace when.
when the world is raging, it's in the shelter of his arms. Once again, I find peace in the time of my trouble. I find peace. In the time of the storm, and I find peace when the world is raging. It's in the shelter of His arm. Can be seated. You know, it's really phenomenal the way that the Lord works things. Uh, putting up several little um, computer, I don't know what you'd call them, little sign work Chuck's been programming for us. And uh, which reminds me, while I'm saying this, he said he was going to get the telephone system fixed where we can reach out to the little branches that we have going and uh, different ones are asking us to uh, reach out by telephone and bring them at least a message a month or something from here from the sacred desk and of course yesterday brother James John Jameson he called from in Colorado we're buying him a generator out there so they can have lights and kind of get underway with things He's found one, so we're going to send him the money for it Monday if the good Lord's will. Try to put some light. And these little computers that we put up, uh, we put a little something on there about the White House on one of them, and then we put on the other something concerning the eternal abundant life work, and then something on the other about the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdom of God. There's three of them, and of course they'll be there uh, with the ladies in the house. We're about ready to give the house to the ladies. It's supposed to have another week. It's taking about a week longer to get the first lady carpet in that we had ordered and that Sister Betty had picked out. So if nothing happened, we'd be turning it over to the ladies pretty quick now because they have, the men have finished their work in it and they've got everything going real well and it'll be our building for international affairs and it's well needed right now. Um, so... The Lord is really blessing and helping us. Brother Carter was telling me that he's sending out hundreds and thousands of tapes now out into the fields, and uh, people are asking for them. And the books are going out, and the tracks are going out, and we get good reports from the letters and whatever. <laughs> We're getting some real good reports concerning our, our little network that we have going out through the Internet. And uh, they've given us the uh, kingdom badge to uh, show that we're among the top, listed among the top as to the churches that they can put this on our archive. And I think they already have received the badge and put it on there to let the people know that it's good material. And the Lord is blessing in every way. But the house, we have these little computers there. They'll be there all the time where the ladies can see them. And they have the church time on there also to remind them of the time uh, so that they won't be late or the different ones won't be late coming to church or if people come in that want to know about the church services instead of having to explain about the little white house or the church services it will automatically do that for them and remind them that the kingdoms of this world belong to God and that the duty of man is to serve God so then everything is going along real good and we hope to be able to let them have the house and I thought it was real outstanding that all this would come to pass about the time that the Palm Sunday came into view. And uh, right now with the situation out in Montana, 
there's a revolt that's going on which we said would take place and uh, that revolt going on out in Montana has stirred the people quite a bit because there's a lot of malicious groups around the nation that are ready to join ranks with this particular group and um, fight against the government. And I don't know whether you remember it or not, but Brother Branham at one time said that the last attack would be on the White House. And apparently the man was with God in the spirit to be able to see that forehead because uh, right now there seems to be a vicious attack on the White House. And we spoke to you about that, of in the last days people would despise government. And we told you a long time back that the reason they would despise government was there'd be two reasons. One of the reasons would be being presumptuous and self-willed. They wouldn't want anybody to have any say-so in their life control over them. And then another thing that's the rebellion of the nations. Uh, another thing is that the people would despise government because the government would become so corrupt and become an ecclesia of boycotting and trying to take dominion over the people as dictators. So it's all happened just exactly that way. And in essence, everything is right at the closing. The great drama of life is finally coming to an end. And kind of like your camp meeting was last camp meeting, when you place the little sign, the last episode, and sure enough, that's exactly what is happening. They place the little altar from that down into what they call the Father's house, and he's been there behind that little desk that we built all this time, and they just took it out yesterday, and they opened those doors that go out the back way that has to do seemingly with the eastern gates and the way the little White House came in. So it was kind of phenomenal yesterday as the brethren worked together in such a unity and such love and um, the way that everything is binding itself together as a little group that's trying to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Another thing was the publication of the writings that went into the heritage, a combination of Brother David's writings and Brother Collins' writings that went into the heritage and this being a restoration of the early American way of life as to the ladies with the long dress and as to asking for the old paths and walking therein and not moving or removing the landmarks of the fathers, bringing back the heritage of our forefathers, uh, it was just the ideal thing. I think the thing that thrilled me most about it was as I looked thumb through the pages and looked at the pictures, I saw one big beautiful cathedral right after another. They just had it filled with the different cathedrals throughout the county and throughout the surrounding areas. And then when we got to our article, which took the middle page of spread, I noticed that it wasn't anything at all about the church as to the building, but it was something that was filled with activity of feeding the poor and getting the gospel out to the world and doing something in the way of world evangelism and taking care of the needy. And I thought, Lord, this is so striking because the other seems to be about the churches and uh, having a name that they live and yet they're dead. Having the great cathedrals, which I'm not opposed to, I think it's wonderful to have beautiful temples for God. But the way that they did it, not having anything in there really as to the gospel or holiness or or any zeal for God in the way of world evangelism, I thought it made the article uh, that came from Bethlehem very outstanding. So I thank the Lord for that and for the man that selected those thoughts and made the, put those things together, constituted those things, so that the people could be better acquainted with little Bethlehem. And some already are saying that they was thrilled to get it because they now know more about Bethlehem. And they said, we just didn't know that was what she was doing out there. So it makes people want to come because it becomes more and more attractive as the veil is moved from God's masterpiece. It is seen more and more to the extent of the whole world coming after it. And it's like the little Cinderella story of the girl with the dishpan hands. The ones that have toiled for God, 
the ones that have been willing to stay out of the parties and the frolics of the world and stay away from their personalities and appearance and want to be more like Christ, to perfect Christ in their life and to perfect holiness in their life, that they might someday, as the bride of Christ, outshine the brightness of the noonday and be the most beautiful thing as the First Lady in glory. Well, anyway, it's good to be here this morning, and uh, I'd like to make reference to the book of St. John, chapter 4 and the 24th verse, we refer to it a lot of times, where Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, saying that you worship you know not what, but God is a spirit, and they that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. I'd like to just dwell on that just for a few minutes just to talk with you and try not to keep you long and I'll let you go. But being Palm Sunday, as I said, this is a real intriguing sort of a day and an intriguing sort of a thought because when we think about Palm Sunday, our mind hurriedly goes back to the Holy Land. I where Betty and I have been in there about eight different times, even been over there doing Desert Storm. And where you still own a place that you bought and paid for right near David's tomb over there. That you might have a part in the holy ground and the holy city. And they still write us, always wanting us to take a part in our place over there. Uh, but when you think of Palm Sunday, you think of that. And then I think again of the little road that Betty and I came up from Lazarus's tomb. Some of you have been over there with us in the Holy Land, and you've been privileged to see some of the places where Abraham and Sarah is buried and see the tomb of Lazarus, and you've been privileged to see this little road that we're talking about. But it's so phenomenal to go into the old country and see the things that's taking place. <laughs> We've tried to get the gospel into the old country as much as we could, uh, we've been able to go down the streets in a prophetical utterance and been able to take books in there and we've been able to give tracts and literature all over the different parts of Jerusalem, that country. And um, we've had a real wonderful time with some of our people over there in preaching the gospel on a number of occasions. And when we think about the Holy Land and we think about this crucifixion in Golgotha, we think about the tomb and the resurrection, and it makes us, it makes things to become a reality. A lot of times, you know, all we do in America is hear about religion and hear about God and hear about a Jesus that we've never known, we've never met, we've never seen so far as his human person. And so then to us, it's really kind of like a myth. It's a story that we're being told all the time, but we don't know anything about it because we've never met him. But over there in the Holy Land, that is a place where people actually met him face to face, felt the touch of his loving hands, and actually saw the blood, his own blood, as it came forth from his body in the behalf of humanity around the world. So then the Bible said, beginning at Jerusalem and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, remission of sin shall be taught in his name. For there is none of the name given unto heaven whereby man must be saved. And there is remission of sin and none of the name except the name Jesus Christ. Though men may come great and men may go. And men may wax great in the world as to their names being ever so great that they are praised from morning till night by people and admired and becomes idols in the minds of the people, whether they're movie stars or whether they're great celebrities or whatever they might be. But there's none so great as the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no name that is like the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that has the power to remit sin and the power of the conquering of death. There has never been anyone that ever met the powers of death or the angel of death and conquered death outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of times we misconstrue things by saying, well, Brother Pike, I know other men that escaped death. I know of Enoch. 
And I know of Elijah, and I know of different ones, and how that these people escaped death and how they conquered death. So the Lord Jesus Christ himself wasn't the only one. But see, that's where you're wrong, and you just misconstrued things because Enoch never conquered death, neither did Elijah conquer death, nor neither did anybody else from the ever... From the beginning of the world unto the end of the world, there is no such thing as anyone ever conquering death except the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ met death head on at Calvary and battled it out with him and conquered him and bound him so that we would be free from death and loose from the bondage of death and we would be free from the curse and then gave us remission of sins in his name. The only reason that Enoch could go was because Jesus had conquered death and by foreknowledge God saw that and allowed Enoch to enter into the benefits of it. And the only way that Elijah could get out alive was that he conquered through what Jesus Christ had done being the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, the application of the blood, and Elijah took the advantage of it, and through the benefit of it, then he was able to enter into glory and stood on the mountain with Moses and with Jesus as they appeared in glory together. And by the same means and the same token this morning, we're able to enter into glory. Someone would say, well, Brother Pike, I don't want to die. I would like to go to glory, but I don't want to die. But if you recall, Jesus did not die to get into glory. He only lived a holy, godly life, and from the manger, he walked all the way into glory. And when John and James was on the mountain with him, Peter, he appeared in glory right here on this very earth. So glory isn't as far away as you would think that glory is. And glory is not as hard to enter into as you think that glory is. And as it was said of John, he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So the biggest thing that we have to remember as to enter into glory is that we enter into the Spirit. And the Bible teaches that God will not give His glory to another and we are not another. We are his own body. We are his own bone. And we are his own flesh. So then he does give us our, his glory. For the Bible said, Father, glorify these with the same glory that I had with thee before the world ever was. And so then he hath given us his own glory. And this glory we can appear in when we move into the Spirit. If you be born to the Spirit... Whereas someone would say, well, Brother Pike, I know that I'm born to the Spirit, but if you're born to the Spirit, the Bible said walk in the Spirit. And so then our problem is not that we're not born to the Spirit. There are people that are born to the Spirit, but the problem is are you walking in the Spirit? We should walk in the Spirit every day. We should meditate in the laws of God day and night, bringing every thought in the subjection to the obedience of Jesus Christ, growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, moving on toward the full measure of the full stature of the full reward, going on to the perfect man, Christ Jesus. The Bible said, go on to be perfect. Don't turn again to lay the foundation of repentance of dead works and faith toward God, but let us go on unto perfection. For it is impossible once you have come to the knowledge of the truth, if ye shall fall away to renew you again under repentance, seeing that you crucified to yourself the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So then it is a dangerous age. You know, the one thing that's going to bring the end of the world? Have you ever stopped to think about the one thing that will bring the end of the world? It's the knowledge of the truth. Jesus said concerning Calvary, he said, now is come light. And this is the condemnation that is in the world, that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That is, now has come the mind of Christ and that they can tell you what's right and wrong, but men love their own thinking and the infiltration of Lucifer as to the love of the world and the lust of the flesh because they love the things of the world and their deeds are evil. 
So then that means that the end of the world will come because the gospel has been published in all of the world for a witness. The Bible said when the truth has gone into all the world for a witness, then shall the end come. So then that means when the gospel has been published in all the world for a witness, then there's no more sacrifice for sin if a person doesn't accept it. Once they reject it, that will bring the end of the world because the blood cannot continue on the mercy seat anymore for there will be no mercy. For there is no more atonement, there is no more mercy, there is no more Calvary for a person that has come to know the right way and will not go the right way. After that, they're on their own. They don't have any more mercy. And inasmuch as sin has to be paid for, then there has to be a price somewhere for sin. If you do not accept the price that the Son of God paid for your sins as to Calvary, to reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin by the body of Christ and alive unto God through the resurrection of His coming forth, then that means that you have to pay the price of sin yourself. And every transgression shall receive a just recompense of reward. I know that we accept the idea that it doesn't matter a whole lot about our stumblings and staggerings. And we have the feeling, you know, everything's going to be all right. We just didn't do as bad as it seems. But the Bible says, seeing that the angels who are greater in power and might, in that man is made a little lower than the angels, received a just recompense of reward for every transgression, how shall... So then it means that you will receive a just recompense of reward and it will be a just recompense. It will be just as to what he does toward you. When you receive this just recompense, will have to pay for your sins because Jesus was not accepted in your life as to your mediator or your atonement for sin. That's one thing that's wrong with the Jewish people of today. They're still wandering around in darkness. They're still blind. They cannot find their way because they thought that they could make it on their own. And having the law, they felt like if they lived a good life, they were God's special people and the predestinated and God would save them. But see, there is no such thing. I try to emphasize to you the same thing that Paul the Apostle emphasized. Paul received the revelation of Jesus Christ and therefore he came to realize that there is no respect of person with God. That he too had been a Jew and felt like that he was special and that other Jews were special and they felt like the Gentiles were dogs and so there was a segregation between them to the extent that they didn't want any fellowship with those kind of people. But they came to realize, or Paul did, that he was no different from anybody else. And rather than being a great prestigious person, after all of the things that he had done, even keeping the law and was guiltless concerning the law, that he was less than nothing. And he said, I'm just less than nothing, that's all. And Jacob, who was supposed to be the apple of God's eye, when Jacob did the things he did, he come to realize that he was less than nothing in the sight of God. And when God addressed him, he did not address him as the great mighty Israel, but he addressed him as Jacob, thy worm, I shall help thee. So then we're no more than a little old worm on the earth unless we are accepted of God. We're just that that is the fallen. So when it comes to the Jews, though they felt that they were special, yet the Lord cut them off and said, I have stretched forth my hand all day long to a disobedient and a gainsaying people, and ye would not. And now I will provoke you to jealousy with a people that's no people, speaking of the Gentiles, and I will go to get my bride out of the Gentile people. And so then the Lord bypassed them, blinded them, and then come to get himself a bride. And he resisted them, saying, I resist the proud, but that he would give mercy to the humble. Humility goes before honor, but pride goes before destruction, and the haughty spirit goeth before a fall. 
Some of them to be lifted up in our own eyes as to be put down in God's eyes. To be put down in God's eyes in the sense of humility, then he will lift us up. That's putting ourselves down in our own eyes. So God will lift us up. The Jews, therefore, are blinded today and must go through the tribulation period. And Paul said, now the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost because they rejected the Messiah. And Jesus said, all of these terrible things will happen to you because you recognize not the day of your visitation. Three million people or more, as the record gives it, came out of Egypt. And when these people came out of Egypt, then three million people could have entered into Canaan, but because of their unbelief, in the Messiah that is in faith in the word of God and not listening to Moses the prophet like unto Christ then that means that they were cut off and the Bible says God swear in his wrath that they shall not enter into my rest because of their unbelief and then he gave a warning to you and I he said in these following let this be a lesson to you he said seeing that these did not enter into my rest because of unbelief, then ye beware lest ye yourselves be cut off and fail to enter into the rest of the Lord because of your unbelief. Let there be not found within you an evil heart of unbelief at the coming of the Lord. <laughs> so we see that the Jews, until they turn to accept the Messiah, cannot be saved. Sometimes we get the erroneous idea that the Jews are predestinated and because they're predestinated that means that they're going to be a special people and be saved or that there are in the world today special people that are predestinated and it doesn't matter whether they go by the blood or not but there is no such thing as salvation without the blood there is no remission of sin in any other name and God is no respect of person he made the Jew, he made the Gentile, he made every race the same. And there's no respect a person with him. And the Bible said he's fashioned all men's hearts alike. So that is to long after God and seek after God and to know that there's something that they are in need of. To fill an emptiness without God. So the Jews are cut off because they did not accept the Messiah. Though they tried to keep the law and walk after the fashion of the ordinances of Moses that did not save them. And even Aaron, the Bible said, going into the tabernacle and into the holies of holies, that he, even offering the blood of bulls and goats, that this could never make the comma thereunto perfect as pertaining to the conscience, God finding fault with that, done away with it, and brought forth the blood of his own son. He said there had to be something different. That is the Holy Spirit has to go into your spirit and take away the guilt or you are still in unbelief. So David of old said, Lord, renew within me a right heart. Give me a new heart. Give me a new way of life. So then the Jews, they have to come by the blood just like everybody else comes by the blood. And at the first of the week, they're sealed under the day of their redemption to the extent that is the first of Daniel's last week, to the extent that in Revelation 14, when the lamb is found on the mount as the new blood sale and that the life is in the blood, Israel turns to that 144,000 who've never defiled themselves, that follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. But if you'll notice that this 144,000 that represents the whole house of Israel has 12,000 from each tribe, whereas the Bible said, And there shall go forth out of Zion the deliverer, and he shall turn on Galen away from Jacob, and the whole house of Israel shall be saved. That these that are saved are saved the same way that you are saved. For the Bible said, and these follow the Lamb. They finally recognize the Messiah as to the blood atonement, and they follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. And therefore the Lamb presents himself on Mount Zion, Revelation 14, as the new blood cell. And when the new blood cell is accepted, 
then the Jews are accepted just like you are accepted and then we all come together a nation is born in one day and then your body will change because the Jews at this point are out in the darkness for the sake of the Gentiles blinded in part till the fullness of the Gentiles should come in these Jews show the death of the body the death of the body of all humanity and as long as they're out of the presence of God it means God does not see the creature and he does not charge anything to the creature as long as the blood is on the seat of atonement then comes the last week of Daniel the time of the Gentiles being over and then the blood is taken off of the seat of atonement and then people have to answer for their own sins right now the blood is there to give them a chance to come to repentance, to where God doesn't see anybody's sins until they come to the knowledge of the truth. And where there's no knowledge of sin, sin is not imputed. By this means, Paul said, God preserved Israel. Not knowing the Messiah, being in ignorance, God did not impute their sins unto them. And where there's no knowledge of sin, sin is not imputed and death is not on the rampage. But when there's a knowledge of sin, death is imputed because sin comes. And sin is imputed. And so then when the Jews come to know God as the Messiah, then they will accept Jesus as their God. So the Jews feeling that they could take the law, and through the law they could be justified, Paul came to reprove them over this saying, and no person, no people can be justified by the law. No one can be justified by the law, for by the law comes the knowledge of sin, and by sin comes death. And to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. So by the knowledge of the law comes sin, and sin comes to kill faith. And without faith it's impossible to please God because the knowledge of sin brings guilt and guilt does away with faith and your lifeline is severed and therefore you are guilty even as Adam and Eve when they violated and transgressed the word of God and found themselves guilty of death. The Jews therefore are going to learn, pardon me, going to learn that they cannot be justified by the law for by the law shall no flesh be justified in that the knowledge of sin comes by the law. Now, if we know that, then they have to come through the blood just like all the rest. But there's coming a time when this will happen. When we think of the Jews and we think of the Holy Land and we think of all these other wonderful things and them suffering the Holocaust and the things they did for the sake of the Gentiles, then we ought to be as compassionate toward them. Them, The Bible said, they that pray for Israel shall prosper. Israel is the apple of God's eye. And we should pray for Israel and pray that God would spare them during the tribulation period as much as he can. And he will to the extent of the ceiling of the 144,000 that nothing can harm them. And then bring this to a full ultimatum in the millennium because... Though the Jews have failed God in that he said in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, I'll make you the head and not the tail if you honor me. I'll make you the tail and not the head if you dishonor me. He hath made them the tail because they dishonored God and now they have to borrow from nations whereas he said, I will make you the head and you'll lend to all nations or many nations. And he's come, they're coming to the power of the throne and will be restored back to their originality. In the days of Nebuchadnezzar, when the crown went down into Babylon 500 years before the coming of the Messiah, it was there that the Jews lost the crown and it went to the Gentiles. And it continued for 500 years through the silent ages until the coming of the Messiah and when he would have restored it to Israel, Israel rejected Messiah and was not prepared for his coming. And even though there were great Bible scholars, they missed his coming. 
They had misconstrued things till they missed his coming. And God blinded them in part that the Gentiles might have the church ages as a chance of repentance. So then we see the great mercy of God. And now we see that Israel's eyes is about ready to come open. If the casting away of the Jews be the reconciling of the world, Paul said, what will the receiving of the Jews be but life from the dead, which means the resurrection or the change of your body. If everybody is dead by the body of the Lord Jesus or by the Jews, then that means when the Lord Jesus returns or the Jews, then Jesus as a head returns to the Jews. And when the Jews are resurrected as one nation in a day, then it means that you'll be changed into your Christian nation in one day and receive the benefits of your creature, which is the body. For he is your righteousness, and when he, our righteousness appears, so it shall be with us. So when we think of all of these things and the wonderful ultimatum of God, then we know that when our mind goes back to the Holy Land, there's something that is inspirational about it that makes us to understand that even though that great Holy Land is there, that still there was something that they misconstrued, and that was that God is a spirit. And the Gentiles today have done the same thing, entering into ritualistics and formalities and churchism. They have overlooked the fact that God is a spirit. The same yesterday, today, and forever to every generation. His word is unaltered and unchanged. He sent his word and healed them. By his word, he cast out the unclean spirits. He made his word flesh among them. And he visited their iniquities with mercy. And that word in the beginning was God. And is still God. And we understand that the world was framed by faith through the word of God. So then we realize that to worship God, we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. You have to worship God in spirit. This means that you've got to be spiritually minded. I would that you were spiritual, Paul said. Seeing that you're carnal, there's envy and strife and malice among you. And you shall never even see the kingdom of God because you're blinded by the ignorance within you. For the kingdom of God cometh not by observation of one observing the times or those kind of things. You observe times and seasons, Paul said to the Jews. I am afraid of you. God is not times and seasons. God is a spirit. You have to be spiritually minded to hunger and to thirst after Christ. And your spirit must long for the fellowship of the supernatural and want to be in the angelic realms and get out of the realms of your human senses of the creature that's contrary to the things of God and that the carnal mind is contrary to God because Satan is the God of this world and he has control of your creature because the creature, even the body of the human senses, was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of God who subjected the same in hope. So then the creature is subject to vanity. And that creature is a bond's child to the beggarly elements of the world by reason of the human senses upon which it depends for survival. So then God is a spirit. We should be in the Spirit on the Lord's day. We should come together in the Spirit. We should worship God in spirit and in truth. We should allow our heart to yield up our spirit when we come to the house of God to enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. His recovering and that they're fixing to come to the forefront and that God has committed unto them the oracles as to the principles of God for restoration of the government of mankind in the earth. What is there as to a prophet in being a Jew? Somebody says, well, Brother Pike, according to where you preach, there's no prophet in being a Jew. Paul said, what is the prophet of being a Jew? Much. Chiefly. 
in every way. In what way? For unto them are committed the oracles and the principles of the gospel of God as to the foundation of government in the earth, as to be the head of the nation, that all people of every race and every nation must come and bow to them and know that he's loved them and that they will have the preeminence in the government to rule and reign with a rod of iron over all the nations and all of the nations that have mistreated them and have not treated them right will be brought to bow before them and they will judge all nations. The judgment of all nations will be in their hands and they will judge all the nations according to the way that they see the thing concerning those people and what they have done and the way that they have lived. The Bible said that God will not judge. He hath committed all judgment to the Son. And the Lord Jesus being mourned among the Jews will be there sitting upon the throne as the nations of Israel judge the whole world. So will the twelve apostolic leaders rule over the twelve tribes of Israel being spiritual Jews and natural Jews as in one. They will rule until the thousand years restoration is over and then the spiritual Jew will come into power to rule throughout eternity while the Jews and all nations are subjected unto the bride of Christ and to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ as members in particular, which of course some of the Jews will be. Well, let's sing a little course together. When you're tossed on life's sea And the waves all cover thee And the storm won't let the sun shine through Then you'll hear a voice say Child, there'll be a better day Don't allow the clouds to hide sweet heaven's view You've got one more valley, one more hill You've got one more sorrow, one more tear one more curve in life's road One more mile to go And you can lay down your heavy load When you get home Don't let Satan see your fears Try to smile above your tears Hold your head up high And give the world a smile just be faithful all the way And it'll be worth it all someday For it's all gonna be over after a while Sing it with me You've got one more sorrow, one more tear You've got one more mountain friend down here one more curve in life's road One more mile to go And you can lay down your heavy load When you get home One more time You've got one You've got one One more curve in life's road One more mile to go And you can lay down your heavy load When you get home Just a little farther And it'll all be over In the meanwhile The Bible said he that occupies till I come if I find him so doing, I will make him ruler over all that I've got. 
But if that slothful servant begins to turn and smite his fellow servant and say, My Lord delayeth his coming, I will come in a day that he think not. At a time when he's not looking for me, and I will appoint him his part with the hypocrite. And there shall be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. The Bible said, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, where the fire is not quenched, and the worm dieth not. So then it's up to you and I. We decide our own destiny. We decide what we want to be in life. It isn't anything that God has done. You know, I think about Sister Ellen praying for and asking God to help her, and some of them was kind of shocked when they go up to visit with Sister Ellen. They're kind of moved about it because she's looking so bad. And of course, we get in a rut, you know, and we say, well, Sure love to see her get healed and love to see her come home. And yet we don't do anything about it as to praying and asking God to help her. And uh, then we say, well, it just might be God's will for her to die. And it might just be her time. We just have to accept it. But folks, let me tell you, there is no time to die. There is no will of God to die. Somebody says, well, Brother Pike, I know that there is because I know people it was just God's will for them to die and to go on. That's because you are misconstrued in your mind and unlearned in God. There ain't never been nobody that ever died when it was God's will for them to die or to go on. The Bible said death is the enemy of God and God does not give His will to His enemies. So it is not God's will for you to die now when you get old or while you're young or die ever. He wants you to live eternally. He gave the blood out of his veins and died at Calvary so that you could bypass death and pass from death unto life. And there's no such thing as a sickness unto death. Somebody said, well, this sickness is unto death. There is no such thing as a sickness unto death. There is a sin unto death, but no sickness unto death. So then, any time that a person gets sick, God wants them healed and well. Any time a person goes to die, whether they are a baby or they are a grown-up, God wants them healed and up from there, and He wants them to go on and wants to fulfill the number of their years. And when He has fulfilled the number of their years thoroughly, He wants to extend their years to an eternal thing that they might live forever because they are his masterpiece and he made them that they might enjoy life and breathe and eat and drink and enjoy the wonderful presence of those things that are round about them. So let's don't let the devil get our faith off in the ditch somewhere and get us away from the Word of God in our own human reasoning and let the devil, which is no good thing within the flesh, outreason us about those things that we can have through faith in God, but rather go on and strengthen ourselves against these things to draw nigh unto God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. When you see somebody having problems or afflictions, Pray for them, believe with them, strengthen them, stand in the gap. Don't go to thinking the wrong way. And don't let the devil get you in a ditch just because they're having problems. That has nothing to do with you, nothing to do with the Word of God, nothing to do with His promises. Can you say amen? amen. All right, let's sing another little course or two. Pass me not, my gentle Savior. Hear my humble wish. And while on the 
brothers thou art called all in oh do not pass can you sing that with me We trust that your heart has been inspired, your understanding enlightened, and your faith strengthened by the hearing of these words of life. We want to thank all of you who have stood with us in your prayers, finance, and labor, thus fulfilling the commandment to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself.